Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Christine Quinn, the recently selected speaker of the city council, has already made history. Will she make more? Here to talk about becoming the speaker, the city council, and the problems and prospects facing the city is Christine Quinn. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. It was historic. It gave me goosebumps, <laughs> and I'm supposed to be objective. Talk about the feeling that you had when you were in that room and there was all that energy in that room. It was great it was overwhelming it was completely exciting you know it was a day that uh, you know you could draw from the adrenaline and excitement of that day for or i hope i can for years to come it was really thrilling and it was really gratifying you know to have my colleagues give me their trust mm -hmm. and to have so many of them speak so kindly about me as they did that day it was really I mean, nice. Jimmy Otto's remarks, the minority leader from Staten Island, was really touching, particularly when he said, I'm Sicilian, I cry, I want tissues <laughs> too. It was really, that morning, as I told you, I yeah. was on the 6 train, ran into Andrew Kurtzman of CBS, and I was sitting there, and Andrew said, what do you, you know, what does this day mean? And I, I just went back 20 years to the gay rights bill, which was so contentious. And I remember the Nazis right. there, act up throwing condoms. How did you feel as a gay woman? Did, how did, 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 was there this resonance there? You know, I, I wasn't there in the 80s when that happened. I was in the council, though, in 92, when Tom Dwayne had to stand up mm -hmm. and disrupt and take over a council stated meeting to give a speech in response to Enoch Williams, the then health chair, yep. saying that the passage of the gay rights bill has caused the spread of AIDS. So in my own moments that I was a part of, though I've certainly heard many stories of the days from the gay rights bill, I felt like there had been a huge evolution mm -hmm. in the chamber. You know, and the chamber had once been a place where, which was about fighting unsuccessfully to get gay rights or fighting unsuccessfully to get AIDS addressed as a health crisis. Mm -hmm. And it felt now like a place where the LGBT community was part of the political makeup of the city, part of the electoral fabric of the city, and that felt like a huge victory. And I was at a community reception last week uh, that some groups did for, in honor of my election. And I said to people, which is true, you know, for decades, the community struggled in the city. And we struggled very effectively with some people choosing to be insiders mm -hmm. and some people remaining outsiders. Mm -hmm. And I think the collective and cumulative effect there has moved the community back, moved the community forward in, in a measurable way. But it only happened because there was this very well-organized uh, amount of hard work that happened with some people being on the inside and a whole lot of people remaining on the outside. So you were an insider and you were an outsider. You know, I think I, uh, once you, you know, on some level, once you decide to join government, mm -hmm. you de facto become right. an insider. I think I've always tried to be an, I started as an outsider. I started as a housing organizer mm -hmm. and for a period of time also was a crime victim, uh, a victim, a crime victim specialist running a, a crime victims assistance agency. So even when I've been in government, I've always tried to remain connected and true to the idea of being a political organizer. And I think you have the best kind of government when it's worked, when pe the people who work in it are people who see government as another political organizing mm -hmm. tool. But mm -hmm. when you're on the inside, you're always on the inside. Okay, let's talk about insiders. The politics, the politics of selection. Uh, Frank Lombardi in uh, a, a piece on January 19th wrote, first paragraph, she's the first gay woman to serve as city council speaker, but Christine Quinn followed the time-honored tradition of her good old boy predecessors when it came to doling out committee posts yesterday. Talk about the politics of committee assignments, both reflecting both your priorities and also your debts, your political debts. Well, you know, it's interesting. In doing the committees this time, there was a lot less change 
a lot less opportunity to move things around than four years ago mm -hmm. when Gifford did it with a completely blank slate. I want to talk to you about the differences, but go ahead. So there wasn't as much, much change as there would have been at other times. You know, we met with every member. That's basically how I spent the first two weeks. And we tried to move, keep people or move people around based on what they said their interests were and what we thought they were good at. Did people who were part of the process you know, put in plugs for people here and there? Yeah, of course. And this is a political process, so that absolutely weighs in some ways. But we really did try to match people to what they wanted to do. But as a leader, you have to, in a sense, discipline your rowdy children. Right. And clearly there was some element of that there as well. Well, no? less than some had hypothesized. You know, people certainly spent a lot of time speculating on what would happen to Charles Barron if right. he got to remain well, you know, we'll the talk higher about ed chair. Okay. So, you know, less than people thought. It was the most interesting part of the whole committee selection process was the press. Because if you followed every rumor, you'd have Which a very I did, different, by right? the way. You'd have a lot of people in different spots. Right. Talk, you've got... 35 committees, three subcommittees, seven leadership positions. You had, and you, you increased the, at least the number of positions. That's a lot of goodies to have people either buy in or buy off. You know, there's always a lot of talk about the, the stipends or the Lulus, as they're called, though John Lou would prefer that name stop. Right. Um, I can understand. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of talk about that. You know, people, it seems to me, when they've come in and met with me, they're not asking for money. They're asking about the issues that they're mm. interested in. Uh, so although the press plays it all about how much extra money people get, I don't really think it is that because you saw people fighting over the substance of the committees they wanted mm -hmm. to be a part of. So I think it's I think that's the easy story. You know, to me, the more interesting story in the, co the uh, committee process was why did everybody want to be chair of consumer affairs when four years ago no one wanted to be chair why of consumer affairs? Why did they want to be chair? You know, p running for public advocate, Mark Green, I don't know. Ah, but large of political ambitions, that's good. So I don't know, so that to me is, is, is the bigger story. You know, there are a lot of committees, more committees than there were. And I think in some ways that's a result of term limits. You know, when there weren't term limits, you could wait your turn to have the opportunity to chair a committee. But if you're only going to be there for eight years, people want to chair committees mm -hmm. sooner because it's a greater way to get things done, a greater way to serve. You have a greater a way to hopeful. establish a record. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think that is partially an unforeseen consequence of term limits. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's so bad to have more committees focused in a more in-depth way on a larger number of topics. Okay, so legislative and institutionally, you're saying that a large number of committees is not a problem. No. I mean, I think if we had this year said, I'm going to make all these extra committees and therefore had to greatly expand the stipend budget, New Yorkers would have the right okay. to stand up and say that is unacceptable. But the stipend budget went down slightly, and we have more people focused in more areas. In some places, like our, you mentioned, Jimmy, a task force on the Department of Buildings. Well, you know, Housing and Buildings Committee has a huge number of issues in mm -hmm. it. And most of February and March are going to be spent in that committee renewing the rent laws. Right. Well, the restructuring of the Department of Building is a priority for a lot of council members. So we can't wait to look at that topic until we finish addressing the rent laws. So it makes sense to give Jimmy and some members that responsibility. What was interesting is that Jimmy Otto is the minority leader, and it's highly unusual. I mean, yes. I go back to the council to, since 78, where you have a member of the minority, a Republican, chairing something as significant as this. And I think it's, it says something. What does it say? Well, it says, I think, that in the council you're judged on whether on your intelligence and your commitment. Jimmy has become an ex expert on the Department of Buildings. He knows it inside out. It's an issue that's important to us. So you need the best guy, regardless of what party that he's a member of, to be in charge of it. Okay, let's talk to Charles Barron. Two things. One, on the day of the vote for the speakership, he abstained. Yes. And the, the substance of his abstention was that he found the process faulty, that the yes. county leaders had too much influence and the independence of the council members was compromised. You know, the process, Talk to me. the process is what the process is. Okay. And this is the real world. You know, I, I wanted to run for speaker. I so did six other people. Right. You don't have the option at the beginning of that process of saying, 
I want to run for speaker, and here is the different way I want the votes to happen. It's like saying you don't believe in the Electoral College, right. and you're going to run for president only if we get rid of the Electoral College. Well, then you're never going to run for president. So you played by the rules I of the game as they're played, and you won. Right. Okay. Undue influence of the county leaders in terms of selection of staff, selection of people in various chairs? I don't see it that way. You know, people, at the end of the day, 51 people voted for speaker. People seek advice and counsel from people they trust. For some people, that's their county leader. For some people, it's their mother. Trust me. <laughs> uh, so that's how it happens. Okay. I don't think, you know... At the when it's all said and done, and we reorganize the staff, which we're doing, and everything, you're going to see a diverse group of people. You know, I've asked members to give me resumes. Mm -hmm. I want to have a council staff that is reflective of all five boroughs and is diverse of the city. To get those names, you need help from other people. Okay, let's now move away from politics to government and policy. What's What's your legislative agenda? I mean, from what I can glean, clearly, given the fact that you are the guru of health, <laughs> that your first legislative initiative is this, this Manny's Law. Right. Could you talk about your priorities and this specific piece of legislation? Sure. Let me start first with this bill. Go ahead. You know, I chaired the health committee for four years, and one of the things we heard a lot from advocates was the problems that uninsured or underinsured people have getting health care. Mm -hmm. So prior to the death of Manny Lanza, many months prior, we began working on a bill modeled on what they did in Nassau County, a bill which requires that when any time somebody goes to a hospital, they be give, that they're given information about the financial assistance programs. Because what people don't know is that if you're uninsured or underinsured, there are fl sliding ski fee scales that exist and payment plans over time, but people are never told that. So we're requiring that hospitals, A, tell people that, B, report to the council on how much, they call mm -hmm. it charity care, I don't like that phrase, but charity care they give, and C, report on how much they get reimbursed, because some hospitals get reimbursed from the state and then also seek money from the patient, which is wrong. Now, Manny, who the law is named after. Talk about the, the particular case. It's a very sad case. Manny Lanza was a young man from Long Island who uh, was a, had he thought in perfectly good health, started having seizures. They found out he had a brain condition. Basically, he was bleeding in his brain. The hospital in Long Island did not have a brain expertise there. They transferred him to a hospital in the city who said, you're not in immediate danger. When you get your insurance, come back. So the danger was correlated to his lack of insurance? I, I would argue yes. And, Oof. you know, if you go to an emergency room and you're bleeding, they're not going to send you away. Right. He basically was, but you couldn't see it. His family even said, we'll sell our house. They said, come back when you're insured. But if they knew about the sliding fee scale, maybe they wouldn't have had and to sell their house. What is the hesitancy on the part of the institution of informing individuals that they've got this you right? Know, they'll have to answer that question for themselves. It's... I don't think there's a good one. You know, it certainly doesn't track with the oath they take as medical sure. professionals. You know, hospitals prefer to take insured people. They get more money and they get it more quickly. Uh, so it's bottom line driven. I think so. I okay. think so. Talk about all the health initiatives before we talk about the rest of the agenda. Well, one of the things I want to do, and I, I talked about this when I was running for speaker, is increase the amount of long-term planning we do in the city co council and in the city. So I would want us to engage and start working on a five-year plan wow. for pediatric preventive care. You know, the child health clinics, they're incredibly important places in the city. They are physically, though, where they were when they were built, some of them over 100 years ago, mm. as milk stations. Well, is that where they should be? Is that where the kids are? Is that where the poor kids are? We need to do some planning outside of a budget context, because when you talk about right. these things in a budget context, everybody hears, oh, my God, you're going to close my clinic. That's not the point. The point is to really do some long-term planning so we can, from policy and budget, respond appropriately. What else is on the agenda? We know that health is on the agenda. What else is on your personal agenda? And what do you see being on the institution's agenda? Well, personally, we're in the process of moving towards developing a system called council stat, 
where all of the council district offices would be on one uniform uh, computer system. And so people would, on a monthly basis, the district offices report back to us on the nature of the complaints that they are getting and responded to. So then when we develop legislation, it can actually be in response to the problems New Yorkers come to us to solve. What about 311? Doesn't that give you data? Well, we don't get the data from 311. Gail okay. Brewer has okay. a bill that would give it to us, and I think that will be helpful. Mm -hmm. I think that would be interesting to also know, is there a different type of thing you call the mayor on versus the person who's your local okay. person? Okay, and you expect that there'd be, there would be differences? I think there could be. What else? What um, else is on the agenda before we get to the hot button items? Well, uh, we have a, a council meeting tomorrow where we are going to be introducing a, st a request for state action on the repeal of the Erstat law. Okay, We're, explain. The Erstat law is an unbelievably antiquated state law that took away New York City's power over, sole power over our rent laws. So right now as the city council we have the power to make the rent laws weaker, which we won't be using, but we don't have the power to make them any stronger. Mm -hmm. And in February, May of this year we're going to have to renew the rent laws, which we're going to seek to do as, um, seek to do completely intact. But Albany has really limited uh, our power and tied our hands. Okay. Let's talk about budget. The mayor released his preliminary budget on Tuesday. Yes. What's the council's response? You know, the budget overall in some ways is a good news budget. Right. There's a surplus. They're talking about rainy day funds. But still, give or take $300 million is cut out of the budget. Those are the programs that the social service programs the council puts back in every and year. And this, this is an annual game. Right. They, people even call it the annual budget dance. It's dysfunctional. It reflects bad governmental planning, and it ha we've allowed the council to be pigeonholed in a place where we are exclusively the ATM for social services. Now, okay. these are good social services. We need them to continue, but they shouldn't be cut solely because they were born from the council. A cut should come up from a mayor when there isn't enough money, when the program is doing poorly, when it's not functioning correctly, or when there's a philosophical or some type of political disagreement. Mm -hmm. But it's inappropriate for the rationale of a cut to be simply the council restored it the year before. So you want to establish a new choreography. You want to change the dance card. How do you change the dance card? Well, I talked to the mayor about it this morning and said, you know, we need to, to sit down and discuss this because this really isn't a full role for the council. And the senior staff in the council have had follow-up conversations with the senior staff of the mayor's office. And we're going to begin a meeting to figure out how we can change this process. Now, look, I think calling for how the budget gets done to be changed is a big call on the council part. And we might not succeed. In the end, we might uh, have to go back in June, in May and put the $300 million back mm -hmm. exclusively mm -hmm. and not look at bigger systemic issues in the budget. But even if we fail, I think we have to try to make the budget process better. Are you sanguine that this is going to happen, given your conversations with the mayor? When you, in, in, your, in your address when you were elected, you talked about working with the mayor, and clearly this is one area. Are there areas where you see difficulties in, in, in working with the executive branch? You know, we'll see as they come. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. But I will say the mayor has been very welcoming, very supportive. Uh, we're meeting every other week, uh, and his senior staff have been very, very accessible. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, let's talk about some hot buttons. Okay. Let's talk about term limits, campaign finance, Walmart, a whole bunch of stuff. Talk about term limits. And I moderated the speakers yes. forum. All seven of you came out in favor of a proposal to amend term limits to have a third four-year term. Right. And I guess six of you said you would do it legislatively. Where are we with term limits, and where is it on the agenda, if it's on the agenda? It's nowhere on our near agenda. Okay. Uh, you know. That means, what's near agenda? I mean, I, it's some, I don't know where it is on the agenda. That's how okay. not close it is. Okay. You know, I'm, I said at the forum you moderated, it remains true. I'm open to a legislative remedy. I'm not, I don't think any of us were that night, opposed to a referendum. Right. Uh, so we're going to have to have a lot of dialogue in the council about where term limits fits in the agenda. Does it fit? And how does it fit, legislatively or in a referendum? Does it happen this, this year? It could happen either way. It could happen whenever it was decided upon. Right. But, you know, we're not talking about it right now internally because mm -hmm. there's too many other, other pressing issues. So it's not something we're going to get to any time soon. You know, one of the things we're going to do in our council meeting uh, on Wednesday 
is, though, uh, change the rules of the council to try to make them more okay. democratic and more open. We're going to make it easier. Uh, you mentioned the gay rights bill. Easier to discharge a bill to the floor. It used to take nine signatures. It will now take seven. You know, when a council member used to... When a council member requested legislation, there was no time frame in which they had to get the bill back. I mean, I still have legislative requests Tom Dwayne put in in 92. Wait a minute. When I was there in 1978, you, we couldn't even get a bill drawn. We didn't get the agenda of the meetings until the day after the meeting. <laughs> so don't tell me. That was under the Tom Cute regime. So. Well, now, if you put in a legislative request in 60 days, you will either get a copy of a draft bill a copy of a memo explaining why we need more time because mm -hmm. there's some things that are going to be super complicated or a memo explaining why it's unconstitutional or we lack jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. But everybody's going to get them back in 60 days so there isn't the perception or the reality that some people's requests move more quickly than others. Also in the rules, we're now spelling out and making it clearer how one uh, could amend a bill on a floor if okay. they wanted to. Okay. Now, as I, as I remember, the, you can now amend it in writing. Are you proposing that you uh, can amend it verbally in the floor? No. We, we are, um, what we did, the, the rules said you could amend a bill. And it right. said you had to bring a copy. But they didn't particularly lay out the procedure, how much time there would be right. with debate, how the debate would be structured. So you have it, but you don't have it. Right. So we expanded on that part of the process. Mm -hmm. We still said you have to have it in writing. I think that's important. But it, exp it says how the debate will happen, how long the debate okay. will be, in the hope that fleshing out that section would make it clear that it was okay to use it. So you, you're looking for transparency and more democracy. Small day, yes. Small day. Now, how does that potentially affect your role as leader? Is there a conflict there? I don't think so. You know, the idea that 51 New Yorkers would agree on anything almost all the time is r absurd. And every New Yorker looks at that and says, that's ridiculous. Right. So the idea that we're going to have votes that are, you know, 30, 15, 40, 11, that's fine. You know, we shouldn't be e working on issues that are such no-brainers that nobody disagrees right. with them. Right, right. Okay. Campaign finance. Again, going to, back to that speaker's form, there was more heat yes. generated talking about campaign finance. And the councils disagreed with the campaign right. finance board and staff for a long time. What do you see as the status of campaign finance? And what do you see the council doing or not doing? Well, I think even the members who have concerns about the, the, the board and some of the rules, and I have concerns about some of the rules, even the members with the deepest concerns want the program to remain intact because it's the best program there is really in the country. I actually spoke to Nicole Gordon today and we're in the process of setting up a meeting with her staff uh, and my staff and, and ourselves to sit down and start fleshing out where they say sit, where they think CFB stuff is at, where we think it's at. You know, one of the things I hear a lot from members is, and from candidates, is it's just so difficult. They feel like they, you need a CPA to fill out the paperwork. And I think there might be a sense among CFB staff, but I don't know, I'm going to ask when I see them, that people are cavalier about the paperwork and, mm -hmm. and the reporting. They're not. People are, like, panicked. No, that I know. I've been on wrong. the inside of campaigns where... Yeah. That is very important. And we need, the point of campaign finance, it seems to me, is so average New Yorkers can get elected mm -hmm. to office, because that's the best type of government. But if you need to be a CPA to work this, the program, then we're not meeting our goal. But, but the two main issues, I think, are, number one, self-financed candidates, the, you right. know, the gazillionaire is, candidate. And the other is candidates at, your, at the council level that really don't have opposition and are getting these matches. I mean, the self-financed candidates is a big issue. There's not a lot we can do right. about it. The Supreme Court has tied our hands. Mm -hmm. So that is what it is. Um, you know, the issue of members who it's don't truly have a competitive race is clearly something we need to look at. Mm -hmm. What I, though, want to really flesh out and talk through with the Campaign Finance Board is, you know, I may think X person is not a threat to a sitting council member, but I may not know the dynamic of that community. I may not know, you know, that they're a DJ on X radio station, which is so popular mm -hmm. in that community, it's better than having a quarter of a million dollars. You know, look at Felipe Luciano almost right. beating Phil Reed right. in 2001. Then that's not to say there aren't moments when members take the public money and they just don't need it. But we have to figure out a way to make that determination so they aren't being made exclusively by people behind a desk 
in a government office. Okay. Walmart, big box stores, Bronx Terminal Market. You've got 30 seconds. We are continuing. We're still negotiating uh, as we tape, and uh, we'll be voting on it on Wednesday. Uh, There's a lot of concern about big box stores in the city. That doesn't mean they're all bad. That doesn't mean they have a place, but it means they're going to have to go through a much more thoughtful and deliberate process. I mean, certainly one big box company that there's absolutely no love for in the city council is Walmart. Walmart. And unless they change, that's not going to change. Okay. Okay. Leadership style. Different from Miller and Vallone. And, and, and to get to the Miller thing, when Gifford came in, there were 38 new council right. members. You've got a much more seasoned right. body. What does that mean in terms of what you can do and, and, and maybe differently than was done in the past? You know, everybody has a different leadership style, but I think really the issue isn't style. It's about the moments that were given. You know, Peter, when he became speaker, the charter just gave the council gigantic powers. Mm-hmm. So he may have had a lot of returning members, but they were now returning to a different okay. job. Gifford came, there was almost all new members. Right. So, uh, you know, we are spending a lot of time now helping the eight new members open their offices. I can imagine what that would have been like with 36. Right. So I have the opportunity now to move more immediately to substance and policy because the learning curve and the technical assistance is just far less than it was for Peter or for Gifford. Excellent. Last question. Legacy. Your term limited out in 2009. On January 2nd, 2010, what do you want the stories to say about your leadership of the city council? That we made the body more effective, that we made the body more open. And I would hope that if you ask New Yorkers in all five of the boroughs, they would say, boy, those 51 people made our lives better. They made our lives easier. Give me some illustrations of some substantive accomplishments that would lead them to say that, that you want to see happen. Well, that we make it easier for the uninsured and underinsured to get taken care Mm -hmm. of, that we improve middle schools in our city, that we help build the economy, that we create more jobs in diverse neighborhoods in all of the five boroughs. Excellent. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you.